A tragedy in Greece as wildfires destroy a seaside resort town. Welcome to Plain English, the podcast that goes at the right speed for English language learners. Listen now and read the transcript online at plainenglish.com. Now, here's Jeff, your host for today's episode. Greece faced its worst tragedy in over a decade as devastating wildfires ripped through a seaside town, killing 80 people and destroying 1,500 homes. Hundreds of people had to be rescued from beaches and the ocean, having fled the flames and smoke on land. Welcome to Plain English, episode number 73. I'm Jeff. JR is the producer, and you are listening to the podcast for English learners. As you know by now, we go at a little bit slower speed just for people who are learning and need that extra little time to pick up on all the words. To help you out, we have a full transcript of this episode online at plainenglish.com slash 73. plainenglish.com slash 73. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter at plainenglishpod. Tell us what you think there. The expression you're going to hear about later on today is flat-footed, so listen up for that. The photographs of Greece's worst tragedy in over a decade are chilling. Dead stalks of burned trees stand while the earth below them is white with ash the odd skeleton of a building still standing. Deep orange high flames ripping through green trees and seaside houses. Cars deformed and destroyed in burned-out streets. This is what was left after a wildfire swept through the town of Mati, a seaside resort not far from Athens, Greece's capital. After two days, only destruction was left where there was once a beautiful resort town. The weather contributed. Temperatures near 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius, and dry winds of more than 60 miles per hour, or about 100 kilometers per hour, were a toxic combination that fanned the flames. Another fire had broken out about 50 miles away, and many firefighters and equipment were occupied, leaving the town of Mati with fewer resources to fight its own fire. The result was tragedy on a grand scale. As in many such disasters, the damage seemed random and arbitrary. One fortunate family was saved from their apartment balcony where all around them the other buildings were destroyed. Some trees and shrubbery looked healthy and untouched, whereas a block away, everything was turned to ash. The geography of the area meant that many residents had to choose between two horrifying options. Risk the clogged roads going away from the water, or head to the sea. In narrow streets near the sea, 
which were built long before the area became a more densely populated resort area. 80 cars were abandoned and completely destroyed. The streets were incinerated and became nothing but a bed of ash. You can imagine people crowding into the streets and realizing too late that there was no hope to escape, abandoning their cars to flee on foot. Hours later, the scene showed only deformed steel frames of the cars, the paint melted off the outside, and the interiors torched. The sea granted refuge to some, but it meant danger to others. Younger, healthier people were able to swim to safety, treading water as they awaited rescue, while others drowned or suffocated from the smoke that hung over the shallow water. Those who survived faced the choice of going farther out to sea or staying closer to the shore where their eyes and lungs would burn from the smoke. The Greek Coast Guard and private citizens in their own boats saved dozens of people from the water and over 800 people trapped on the beaches. In the aftermath of a disaster like this, there are clues that allow you to imagine the last desperate moments of people who were fighting to survive, but who could not. And so it was in this case, too. A long stretch of the sea was bordered not by beaches, but by steep cliffs, and there was a narrow staircase leading down from dry land to the sea below. Twenty-six people were fighting their way through smoke-filled streets, searching for a way to the safety of the sea. From where they were, there was only one narrow staircase down, only one escape route to the water. The bodies of those 26 people were found just yards from the staircase. Officials think that the people either didn't know about the stairway or just couldn't find it in the thick smoke. They were trapped between a sharp cliff and the approaching flames. Some of their bodies were discovered in an embrace. They died hugging and comforting each other. Over 80 people died and 1,500 homes were destroyed, not to mention the damage to the natural landscape. Officials now believe there are serious indications of arson, meaning that the fires may have been started on purpose, but it is too early to tell for sure. The government was caught flat-footed and underestimated the scale of the fire until it was too late. The city did not give an evacuation order when the fires first appeared, and the town appeared to have no serious evacuation plan. There are two links I'd like you to check out after you finish listening to this episode. The first one is a moving article in the New York Times, which is beautifully written and captures the scene of the tragedy. It's a great piece of writing, and I bet you'll understand most of it. The link to that article is in the show notes. 
The other is a link to The Guardian, a newspaper in London, which has the most dramatic photos of the tragedy that I saw on the internet. The pictures really allow you to imagine the scale of this terrible tragedy. The links to both those articles are in the show notes, which you can see in whatever app you're using to listen and on the website. I want to say hi to Luciana and all her students in Santo Andre in Brazil. Luciana is an English teacher, actually, and assigned her students to pick a topic of interest and write a podcast just like plain English and then record it. Luciana says that listening to this podcast is the best way to practice listening and to be informed about world events at the same time. Hey, Luciana is the English teacher here, so who am I to argue? Thanks for spreading the word, Luciana, and keep us up to date about the assignment with your students. I'd love to know what they choose and how they sound. Don't forget to write back when they're done, okay? The expression I'd like to share with you all today is flat-footed. What does it mean to be caught flat-footed? It means you have not reacted quickly. Flat-footed. Let me illustrate this for you with an example from sports. When I was learning to play baseball as a kid, our coaches taught us to be ready by balancing our weight on the balls of our feet. That means you bend your knees a little, you put your weight on the front part of your foot with your heels up a little bit in the back. That way, if the ball is hit or thrown to you, you are ready to jump Move front to back, left to right. You're ready to move your body, to react, because your body is ready to move. If, however, we were standing flat-footed, straight up, knees straight, and our weight flat on our feet, we would be slower to react. So in English, when you say someone is caught flat-footed, you mean that person was unable to react quickly. That's how it was in Greece, where the local government didn't issue an evacuation order. There was a window of a couple of hours in which they could have ordered everyone to leave, but they didn't recognize how bad the fire would get and they missed their opportunity. They were caught flat-footed because they were not in a position to react quickly when they needed to. Incidentally, you almost always say caught flat-footed. That's the full phrase, caught flat-footed. You remember the story a few weeks ago where the electric scooters started appearing in some American cities and the governments had no idea what to do about it? Do they ignore it and let it happen? Or do they need to pass rules about where the scooters can be left at night? Cities like San Francisco were caught flat-footed. Something happened and they didn't react in time. Now, there are scooters strewn about in their streets and parks. Do you remember Blackberries? Some of you might. Blackberry was the original smartphone, and it was focused almost entirely on email. Then Apple came out with its touchscreen 
iPhone. Blackberry was caught flat-footed. They were so into their world of email, they didn't realize there was much more that could be done with a smartphone. That's all for today's episode. JR and I thank you for being with us again this week. If you'd like to get in touch with us, maybe share some ideas for future episodes or expressions you'd like to learn about, I'll give you our email addresses. They are jr at plainenglish.com and jeff, J-E-F-F, at plainenglish.com. I know some of you might be a little shy about writing in English, so you can send JR a note in Spanish if you want. I mean, you can send us a note in any language you want, but if you want us to understand it, it has to be in English or Spanish. But listen, there's no reason to be embarrassed about writing in English. We're all friends here, no judgments. But if you're more comfortable writing in Spanish, that's okay too. JR at plainenglish.com and Jeff at plainenglish.com. Thanks again for being with us today. Don't forget, we'll be back on Monday. On Monday, we'll talk about one isolated man in the Amazon forest who has been living without human contact for over 20 years. It's an incredible story, so don't miss it. See you Monday. Thank you.